All right, how have you been? How's it going? I've been doing well. I've been doing well. How are you? I'm pretty good, yeah. Things have been better, but moving through finals week. Amen. So before we get started with anything else, I think since this is a podcast about capitalism, it's valid to say that we're not going to be peddling any cryptocurrencies today or talking about a self-help book, not but at all. we really want to just get to the fundamental understanding of what capitalism is and how we can talk about it. So I'm Ben. My name's Adidia. And we both study economics and political science here at Penn State. And with that experience, the classes we've taken, I think we've fully experienced the Dunning-Kruger effect, that we know as much as anybody else that people truly don't know anything about economics. Ourselves included. For sure. Um, and it's crazy because people will really criticize anything about the status quo without even taking the time to understand it at first. Yeah, it thinks like I think back to when I'm driving my car and that blinker is always coming on telling me there's something wrong. And even though I have no idea what or how to fix it, I feel free blaming the mechanic for all the problems. For real, I, I actually have this conservative friend who keeps talking about deregulation when the only regulations he even knows about is the 2022 NFL rulebook. <laughs> Kind of reminds me of one of my friends that was excited to volunteer on the Bernie Sanders campaign until she found out that he doesn't even pay his own employees $15 <laughs> an hour. Yeah, man. I, I think we need to up the ante of economic knowledge among our friends. Yeah, if you had your conservative friend with you and I had my socialist friend here with me today, what's the bare minimum that we should tell them so that they can really understand the concepts and have an argument about capitalism? Sure. Well, I think, first of all, we got to define what capitalism is. Yeah. Uh, then I think we should work through how markets work, um, capital formation, what the hell they do on Wall Street. Um, and maybe at the end, give people an idea of how politicians capitalize off of our collective misunderstanding of economics to win these political points from us. Then let's start at the beginning. What would your definition of capitalism be? Sure. And I want to give a disclaimer. This definition is going to sound very technical at first, very pedantic. But hopefully by the end of this podcast, we're going to all get a much better idea of what everything means. So I would define capitalism as a method of capital allocation predicated on the existence of markets, capital formation, and private ownership. That's a great definition. I think we should take it in part so that we can really understand all of those individual concepts. So your definition started with the idea of markets. What is the role that they play in society? And what's really the core point of markets in an economy? Sure, yeah. So you really see markets organically form along with human societies itself. Yeah. Right? When we first start off as little hunter-gatherer groups of 30 to 100 people, you know everybody else, you know what they do, you know what they want, and you know what you can give them to get what you want. But as society grows and you see civilizations of 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million people, it becomes extraordinarily difficult to know how you need to exchange goods to different people to give them what they want. What's the solution to all of that complexity then? Sure. So this is when you see the emergence of currencies to level the playing field. Yeah. And you also see uh, the emergence of markets where information becomes priced in. And so buyers and sellers don't need to know everything when they want to purchase a good. So for example, if there is a drought and the supply of crops is a lot lower, across all of the markets in town, you're going to see the prices go up because the supply is lower. And you're saying this kind of happens organically within the system. There doesn't need to be a king in the society saying that the bread needs to be more expensive, but rather it's being driven by those market forces you talked about, supply and demand. Right, right. I think that if we kind of take that into the modern world now and look at some of the ways that prices convey information, it can really drive home the value of having markets. I think about in sports betting, whenever my friends and I are wondering whether or not Penn State is expected to beat Ohio in a game, they don't ask what the experts are saying or what the pundits on Fox are talking about for predictions in the game. They say, what are the sports odds? What are the betting odds? And it really made me think, why do people trust those odds so much? What is the message being conveyed? It's not being determined by statisticians mm -hmm. or by expert sports analysts, but rather by a market. And I think the idea there is that when people collectively put their money behind their opinions, behind their thoughts, they're reflecting a holistic calculation within society. So when a majority of people are buying betting options, they think Penn State will win, that reflects this idea that Penn State is favored overall. 
Got you. Okay. Well, what? A, see, that's sports. That those are like deterministic games, right? Like, how about something more common, like steel or like some kind of commodities? Yeah, I think that there's some real world anecdotes that happen every single day when um, leaders in economies or in businesses have to make important decisions about allocating resources. One of the first things they ask is, what are the costs associated with various projects? So if we imagine that I have the option to either build a railroad with steel in Pennsylvania or build a similar railroad in Ohio. And I believe that they're each going to have similar value to those communities. It would be a challenge to decide where to build the railroad with limited resource if I didn't have information on prices. I would probably need to take experts from both of those states, bring them together, really have them do holistic projections, all of those calculations on their own. But if I know that in Pennsylvania, the market for steel and labor is cheaper than it is in Ohio. That's telling me that this same outcome, the same benefit to Pennsylvania can be achieved at a lower cost. And with that information already, it's easy to make a decision. Okay, so the prices in a market can automatically kind of filter out who deserves to get what, in a way. In a sense, they're really telling you what the most efficient use of those resources is without you needing to do a full exploration. And certainly there's other factors that can be considered and that's where we kind of think about market failures and times for the government to step in. But at its core, markets are conveying very valuable information to make an early decision. Okay, got you. Well, I think this is a good time to maybe move on to the next point yeah, in the so definition. Yeah, so I really wanted to ask you about those capital formation. What is capital formation and how does it play into our economic system? Sure. So capital is anything that is not a person but helps you produce a good, right? In other words, it, they're means of production. And capital formation is just the accumulation of that capital. So I think you see in capitalist societies that this idea of capital formation as a crux of innovation because we, we see that innovation in the form of technology, in the form of increased output, and we really do think that that progresses humanity. What are some examples of capital formation? Sure. Um, you know, Apple starts in a garage and then a few years later has factories all around the world producing millions so of So it's this idea of really scaling up a business. You start with a lemonade stand and then suddenly you're shipping lemonade across the country. Right. And then you hire people in marketing to help sell it to people. You come up with new flavors of lemonade and you really make lemonade the best it could be. Right. Yeah. And I guess what are the motivations behind that? Why do people have an incentive to start a business in their garage when they could just work for a more secure pre-existing industry. Sure, well that kind of touches on private ownership, which we'll definitely get to later, but one of the things that we see in our current economic state yeah. that really help facilitate the, um, the promulgation of capital is the use of debt to fuel capital formation. Um, instead of just having to save up your whole life to build up this nest egg to start your you know, budding smartphone company idea, you can talk to investors, you can talk to banks, and you can get capital in the form of money to then invest and to build up these different technologies and factories and such. So you really have access to this full marketplace of money itself that you can then tap into to invest in your own businesses and enterprises. Exactly. And you touched on this earlier, but I kind of want to ask you now, what do you think is combining capital formation and debt and markets? Like, what is this glue holding this whole paradigm together? Absolutely. I think that what brings together markets and debt is the market on debt itself. So we know that within an economy, there are limited resources and money is one of those resources that has a limitation. So when everyone has ideas for businesses they want to start, but there's only so many businesses that can physically be funded, there becomes a competition of ideas where people need to pitch their own proposals in a marketplace where everyone else is doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then the people with money, whether that be banks, investors, people saving for retirement, are effectively voting with their money on which ideas they believe are the most successful and have the most potential to provide a return. And that brings to that profit incentive that you were asking about. So why might someone want to take their money and give it to someone else? It's this idea that you will be entitled to potential returns and that you're also liable for the risk if that venture doesn't succeed. So if you came up to me with a proposal on a new app and I felt like it was successful, that I really believed in it, and I gave you my own money, 
I'm effectively taking a stake in your future outcome of that project. And that's our motivation is you want to see your project succeed so that you can be entitled to the returns. And now I'm vested in your success as well. And that's really the relationship between someone giving out a loan and someone going into debt. Okay, so there's this market of ideas. Yeah. And profit motive and private ownership are a way of making sure that we are held liable if these are good ideas or bad ideas. Certainly, because we know that all businesses don't succeed and that for every Apple that started in a garage and blew up into a trillion dollar company, there's been hundreds of companies that went under. And I think that during the COVID pandemic, people really started to watch local businesses close down. Mm -hmm. And they might wonder, why are some businesses closing when others aren't? Is this an effective system where we see businesses shutting down and people losing their jobs? And what we see happening during those instances of economic recession, of economic retraction, is that the access to money in the economy is reduced. And because of that, there's less ideas that can be promoted. And so the market that we talked about, the market on ideas, becomes smaller. And Mm -hmm. only the most popular, the most effective ideas are able to thrive within this new, smaller environment. Okay. So you're saying then in this kind of paradigm, then, um, recessions are almost a way, at least in theory, of kind of cleaning out bad ideas. Or at least that's a byproduct of them. It's not so much that, like, we want a recession to come so that worse ideas are wiped out of the economy but it's a sense that that is a byproduct of a recessionary period and that a byproduct of an expansionary period like the early 2000s would be the explosion of new applications new industries new products and it's this it really is a kind of a cyclical trend of new ideas then being refined and those new ideas are able to grow So then what's kind of the value of having this open market of ideas where you can make money or lose money off of making these bets? Like, what what do we gain as a society from this? I think the value to the society that these markets provide is that it gives us a way to evaluate ideas in a sense that everyone has the capacity to vote with their money and everyone has the capacity to propose ideas in the form of seeking out investment in their own initiatives. If this was more of a fully command economy, a lot of those decisions are being made at the highest levels of government and resources would theoretically be allocated on a much more planned basis. Whereas in our economy, as it currently exists with markets, every single person is able to pitch their idea and it's really treated with the indifference of everyone who's deciding whether or not it's something they want to risk their own money on. Okay, and and do you think as a byproduct that you might actually see truth be more readily available? I certainly think that these markets don't lie, that when we go through a recession, oftentimes businesses that were barely holding on before will be the first ones pushed out. And that's a very revealing truth that comes from the markets. It's a very difficult truth to know that maybe some idea you've invested in or something you really believe in is not desired in the economy or that people don't really want to purchase that product in the moment. And you can't escape that when there's a marketplace. Okay. Understood. Well, um, how do you think, I guess, shifting more out of the theoretical realm now, yeah. now we've kind of defined capitalism, and going into the human experience of it, the political experience of it, how do people interact with a lot of these terms? If we look back on history, I think we find a really funny trend where things that we now accept as core elements of our capitalist system were being called socialist policies just 50 years ago. And that really begs the question of where do you really draw that distinction between something that is capitalism and then is socialism or is potentially communism. And it's good to remember that economies and things of this nature exist on a spectrum. And a lot of people feel like they need to defend this idealistic notion of capitalism being absolutely free markets in every industry and every aspect. But in truth, there's a reason why societies have moved away from that model. And some of the most effective economies in the modern world have a lot of elements of state-owned enterprises or heavily regulated industries. And I think that that doesn't make those systems no longer capitalist at their core because they still have those tendency we're talking about. There's still markets. Mm. There's still private ownership. And there's still capital formation. But perhaps the government has identified that something like healthcare is a core right, and they don't want that to be 
affected by the cyclical nature of markets that we discussed. Okay. So they may take that off the table, but that doesn't suddenly transform their whole economy and turn Sweden into a total socialist country. Really, there's this spectrum where some industries could be regulated more than others. And I think when we debate these topics, it's good to recognize that nuance of something, one policy to potentially reform healthcare or reform social security isn't going to fundamentally erode those core tenants. You gotcha. Okay. So like when they're saying, oh, they're full on socialist, they're going to make it a whole socialist state or a whole libertarian state. They're usually not actually. It seems like a scare tactic for the most part. If we okay. think to some of the few economies that have truly been socialist states, it's not that they simply enacted health care for all or that they implemented welfare reforms. They typically take full control over the economic planning. And the government then becomes entitled to the returns on those products, on those industries. And that's where we start to see challenges to the norms you talked about. Okay, got you. So if the government takes my garage startup, that's when I should actually start. Right? Yeah, maybe okay. that's where you can start to claim that they're coming to steal your property. But okay. until then... We have thriving examples of industry in the United States, like Wall Street. What is the role that they play in our economic system? Sure, yeah, and it, you know, I think almost deliberately, it's pretty, it's kept pretty vague on Certainly. what exactly I, happened. I can't say I have a good understanding of it, so I'm excited yeah. to hear what you have to share. Sure. So at least when I think about Wall Street, really two functions come to mind. There's investment banking, mm -hmm. and then there's sales and trading. And both actually play key roles in some of those definitions of capitalism we mentioned earlier. So investment banking has a lot to actually do with the process of capital formation. Yeah. Whether or not that's taking private companies and making them public, thus exposing them to investor money. And that to, market of ideas that we talked about. And the about. market of ideas. So they open themselves up to all this free money um, that they can then invest in capital and these new factories and whatever. But they also are held to a new standard. A of whole lot of scrutiny that comes from those investors. Exactly. Another thing that's done in investment banking is mergers and acquisitions, um, where you might combine two companies or a company might try and buy another company. And the idea is that they're going to be more efficient and be able to provide a better value to the consumer, or at least to their own shareholders at the minimum. Um, and another thing, the final thing that at least comes to my mind is what's known as restructuring. And this is when you'll see a company maybe make its internal processes a bit more efficient, maybe combining different divisions or even uh, packaging a division uh, separately, right? For example, Johnson & Johnson recently took its consumer division and made it a different company. That's a restructuring job. And I'm sure that investment bankers definitely played a, played a part in that. The other part of Wall Street is known as sales and trading. And they have a lot more to do with the markets. It's really their job of providing what's known as liquidity to these big investors. And liquidity is just how easy it is to buy and sell things on a market. And the idea is that because there's always an efficient way to move large quantities of different products through these markets, the markets are going to be more stable and they're going to better convey information. And so that's another arm of Wall Street. Now let's talk about Wall Street's best friends, or on some days their worst enemies, Republicans and Democrats in power. What's the relationship that the government has with our economy and with the capitalist institutions that exist on Wall Street? Sure. This is something I want all of our viewers to understand when it comes to like politics and how the economy interact, that the government really doesn't, at least the people you elect, they really don't have a huge amount of leverage over where the economy goes. Or at least immediate control over the actions in our economy. Right. That is almost always up to market forces. And those politicians can maybe pass fiscal policy that can, I guess, press on the brakes or press on the gas a little bit harder and really accelerate the innovation in a certain part of the economy or maybe slow down a different part by regulating it. Like, for example, the recent CHIPS Act, where the government was really trying to stir the chip manufacturing industry in the United States. That's an element of stepping on the gas in a particular industry. For sure. Or maybe if there's a recession and they don't want it to hurt as much, they're going to start spending a lot more. And you see this with stimulus checks, right, during the pandemic. So what are some of the common ways that people are misled when it comes to the intersection of politics and economics? Sure. One thing is really big, too. It's that there's usually a lag effect on a lot of these things. Um, you know, a, a common one that I've heard is you know, that, that 
um, the economy was great under President Trump, but the economy was also on a very, very good path towards the end of the Obama administration. And it's in all likelihood, Trump did inherit a lot of Obama's economy. And you can actually say a lot about the current Biden administration, where now we're seeing historic reinvestments in American factories and American jobs. A lot of that, you could argue, actually is happening. Uh, and this is investment coming from other countries, right? A lot of that might be happening because of the Trump tax cuts and how the corporate tax rate went down 14%. That could have had a part to play in making America more attractive to foreign investors. Absolutely. And as recent as the 2022 midterm elections, Republicans were campaigning very hard on high inflation levels and criticizing the Biden administration's response to that. When in reality, I think when a lot of economists look at inflation, they don't say necessarily that it was Biden's policies that are the main catalyst for that inflation, but rather the monetary policy that the Federal Reserve embarked on in order to stimulate the economy during the COVID recession. All of those things that mostly predated Biden's policies while he was in office. Right. I mean, you see this all the time in politics and, and just with economics in general, where the, po the policymakers and the people at the places like the Federal Reserve, they try their best to kind of anticipate where the world's going, but sometimes they just get straight up surprised. Nobody could have predicted that you'd have a pandemic that threatens the lives of millions of people, but that actually doesn't threaten them enough that it completely destroys the economy and they end up actually over boosting the economy with their stimulus and that somehow supply doesn't catch up. Like there's no way if you told me we'd have a global pandemic, that is the way things would end up playing out. It's quite a surprise to see how we went into COVID and we were talking about how we may be in for a long-term recession with no way out. And then one year later, the news is saying that we've overstimulated the economy. It's overheating. Now there's inflation and right. we've done a complete reversal. It just goes to show that even the highest policy decision makers in our country have a challenge to predict the consequences of some of these major economic decisions. Yeah, I mean, even coming into recent inflation, right? If you're a policymaker sitting in their shoes, you think that like, okay, um, well, we, we're kind of recovering from COVID and maybe the supply chain pressures are going to ease. So we're going to see inflation go down and then boom, Russia, Ukraine happens and all of a sudden energy prices double and that whole thesis goes out the window and you're really dealing with a mess on your hands. Absolutely. And I think talking about the relationship between politics and capitalism, it's a good time to talk about some of the instances where the government has deemed markets to be ineffective or immoral. And in our efforts to kind of talk about capitalism in a way that's digestible and understandable, we've certainly oversimplified some aspects of it. So let's okay. touch on some of the common criticisms of our economic system as it currently exists. Sure. Um, I think you have better insight on this than I do. Absolutely. I think then we talk about profit motives, right? And we mentioned how there's a cyclical nature to capitalism that at times in the name of efficiency, it means people losing their jobs. It means industries going under. We talked about a certain ruthlessness of markets and revealing what people want to purchase and what they don't. But I think the reality of a system like that is that when people do have nearly equally valid ideas, but because of circumstances, one person doesn't have the same resources to pursue theirs, they're going to end up in a significantly worse situation than someone else. Or Right. I mean, when we talk yeah. about this idea that people can vote with their money, there's this assumption that they have money to begin with, right? It's only a privileged few amount of people who actually have enough money to kind of start betting on these ideas and really investing in their ideas. It's absolutely true. Also, the way we just see the world works, I mean, you can sometimes influence people at the highest levels with your money to make them think you have the best ideas. And you can actually get a lot of windfall that way, too. And and we're even just talking about capitalism as it exists in the United States, but you take an economy like ours that's $23 trillion, and we have our multi-billion dollar corporations going to countries that have a fraction of our GDP and then exploiting the cheaper labor that's available there. And that is absolutely a byproduct of capitalism where we talked about a profit motive. People, above all else, want to reduce costs and charge the maximum price they can, even if that means not paying people livable wages. And so right. that is a market failure, as economists would say. And that's a situation where the government can step in with minimum wages, welfare payments, or unemployment policies. That Yeah, I mean, we've seen this happen since the 90s. And only now it's starting to get corrected. But yeah. over the course of a generation, millions of working class Americans had their jobs shipped off abroad. That That is something that really happened just due to market forces, right? 
And for the sake of efficiency, I think so many times we find it very easy to justify like pe bad things happening to people, right? And this often conflates that um, this connection, right, between making something more efficient. It's easy to forget that these are real people with real lives, real livelihoods that are going to get impacted with your decisions. And I think we often miscast the debate happening in our government as a debate with supporters of capitalism and opponents of capitalism. But the real debate is what kind of bounds do we want to set on capitalism? Where do we put the floor with welfare packages, with unemployment to ensure that people have a safety net? And where do we put the ceiling? At what point do we say, you have made so much money that it's excessive or your corporation has become so large that it's becoming a monopoly. That's the real debate. Right. It's not whether or not we have these markets, but where do we set the lower and the upper limits so that everyone has a fair playing field to operate within? Right, because you definitely also don't want to overcorrect and stamp down on innovation and the people who create, right? Yeah. When you remove that profit motive, when you remove that private ownership, I don't really want to know what's going to happen to society, to be honest. So there definitely is a really, really tricky balance, and, um, and there's always a path to progress, which is something that... I've noticed. Absolutely. And I think that it's surprising when we see other countries that have even committed themselves to pursuing a more socialist economic outlook like China. They have introduced immense elements of capitalism into their system. I think they may have higher floors and lower ceilings than us, but they've also identified the value that markets provide. Right. They, they liberalized their economy, opened it up to market forces, and in a generation, 400 million people lifted out of poverty. That, that's a success story you don't really see in human history that often. Absolutely. And it just really talks about the complexities of economics as right. a study. For sure. Well, I think we've gone on a pretty long amount about the different intricacies of the definitions of capitalism, the different implications in like the policy realm. Um, so I hope you guys really did learn something from all this and that you can maybe take a new perspective on the world around you. Arguably, there's been no other study that has influenced the world more than economics. So if any of these topics remotely interest you, we would strongly encourage you to read more about it, ask friends and professors, and try to understand as much as you can the way money moves around you. At the very least, you're going to make a few extra bucks. <laughs>